Thanks. Okay. Wow. That was really scary. I'm going to tell you a story now. Mount Buffalo is back, so we're going to go in the front row. <laughs> okay. I know, I know. I see myself every day. Um, a couple of months ago, wow, whatever I was eating the last time I used my computer was very sticky. <laughs> Seems like it maybe had orange in it. Um, I, uh, I was cleaning out my garage because I want to build a brewery in it. And I have, I have, all right, give it up for garages full of shit that you don't need. I'm cleaning out my garage and uh, I'm finding all this stuff, these great artifacts. And I uh, spent like, what probably would take me one day, took four and a half days because uh, it was a very emotional experience for me. I came across all these things that are left over from like a lifetime in the entertainment industry. And uh, I, I sort of like, everything was like a little time capsule from like, from Stand By Me or, or from a lot of stuff from Star Trek or from some other things um, that I did. Things from, like, you know, Ann and I were dating. And uh, I came across uh, so much stuff that I had to just keep stopping because I'd get overwhelmed with emotion uh, because it was, it, was, you know, it was like that. But I was live Twittering it also, which also made it take a long time. <laughs> because, you know, I got to put the picture of the jacket on the thing and then go back to work and, oh, you know what, I probably have to go spend a half an hour reading Twitter replies or not working. Anyway, uh, somebody, I have all the pictures. I'm eventually going to do a blog post about it and somebody on Twitter suggested that I call it Wilhouse 13. <laughs> so really like, we really liked a lot. And uh, uh, anyway, one of the things that I, this story is about the thing that I found. And this is also really far out of my comfort zone. Um, I read this at Woodstock Founders Night. Um, right? Let's give it up for Founders Nights. And, uh, and I have the same sense of nausea that I had before I did it then. So this is, uh, this is, a, this is a, a new piece, but it's actually, it's actually very old. So, and I'm sorry that I'm reading it off of this computer screen. We had to talk about uh, how this is HP's fault. <laughs> so the year is 1994. I am 21 years old. And though, oh, I need the screen, by the way. Sorry, I forgot to do that. Well, it's over. I ruined it. Ruined it all. Nope, I didn't ruin it. Maybe I ruined it. I wonder if there's some kind of like to make the screen come down, they have to get it's like nuclear launch code keys. There you go. Okay, good. All right. And now if you could also just go to your bunkers because the missiles have been launched. How weird is it that an asteroid blew up in the sky over Russia today? I know, I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about that. I can, tell you, I can tell you who's really excited about it. Thank you. I, I can tell you who's really excited about it. My dad, who's convinced the Cold War is still happening. My dad's really excited about that. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I can tell you that this is not a Pliny the Elder that was smuggled onto the ship for me. Can be sure of that? Oh, man. Yeah, we are going to do that YouTube series called Watch Will Drink a Beer. This is the pilot. Okay, so... So the year is, is 1994. I'm 21 years old, and though I'm convinced that I'm very mature, I'm having a very hard time finding my way out of a 10 by 10 room that has one door and a map. I'm struggling to figure out who I am, struggling to figure out what's important to me and what I'm gonna do with my life. I've spent some time working uh, for a company called New Tech, uh, and I'm living in Topeka, Kansas. And what we do is we make this really great video editing software called the Video Toaster. And we are, we're, yeah, and, um, the, the, yes, you're correct, that's the appropriate response to that. We are sort of the great-great-grandfather of um, iMovie and Final Cut and all of these non-linear editing systems that we all completely take for granted today. Um, but, like, we were, we had this idea, um, the company that I work for had this, had this idea that uh, technology should not get in between a person's creative idea and making that idea a reality. Money shouldn't be a barrier to that. And uh, we ended up revolutionizing the porn industry, so good for us. 
Mark, I've spent some time working for New Tech, and while I'm very proud of the work I've contributed to the Video Toaster 4000, something just doesn't feel right in my life. I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be doing. I am adrift in a sea of post-teenage confusion. And I'm profoundly, I mean profoundly immature. Luckily, I'm self-aware enough to know how little I know, so I've been attempting to educate myself about the world, trying really hard to level up. I've been reading philosophy books, because that seems like something smart and insightful people do. But I've gotten wrapped up in Nietzsche's Beyond Good and Evil, and I have become something of an obnoxious fucking intellectual. <laughs> now, I will eventually grow out of this phase, but at this particular moment in 1994, I'm dealing with the aftermath of being this guy. <laughs> and this guy. Please note the... Uh, Those are called sexy tears. And this guy, I don't know what that says, but I'm fairly certain Super Terrific is in it several times. Uh, and of course this guy. Now for those of you who for some reason can't see, let me just show you that uh, I am wearing rollerblades, the Lightning model of rollerblades, with my muscle builder pants that are tucked into the rollerblades to prevent I don't know, things from getting into them, or probably the shame from running out of me. Uh, I, now, uh, for safety, I've taken off most of the swatches. Uh, I'm only wearing one, and of course I have a friendship bracelet on there, because that's a good thing to have. And uh, in case you weren't aware of what was going on down here, I've worn a t-shirt that lets you know that the activity I'm engaging in is in fact rollerblading. And there's an outline of a person who does what I guess rollerblading actually is. I mostly did falling down. Um, so why not have a photo shoot in a place where I'm also sitting on a tree, you know, like you do when you're rollerblading. <laughs> so I'm dealing with the aftermath of having been that guy for my entire life to this point. And it isn't easy. In fact, it's pretty goddamn painful. <laughs> But I don't know how to talk about what it means to be that guy. I don't know how to deal with what it means to be that guy. So I project this aura of overconfidence that, in retrospect, is really embarrassing. But something important happens at this moment in 1994, and it happens on a Star Trek cruise in Alaska. It will change my life. It will set me on a long and meandering course out of the sea of uncertainty and toward the man I will eventually become. It happens because I find out that I am expected to perform with the other actors on the cruise's talent show, and I am forced to confront the reality that I do not have any talents. All I can do is act, and at this moment, I'm not sure that I'm very good at that. So I take a walk around the deck of this ship, and instead of pretending to be deep in thought, as usual, sort of punched over James Dean walking against the wind style, like you do, I actually think, and really think about who I am, and what is really important to me, and I wonder what I can contribute to this talent show. And the honest truth is, I am terrified. I feel like a complete fraud I wonder if there's a way that I can sneak out of this thing and, and, and not be part of this. And then I remember that I'm on a boat, and the water is very cold. So I continue walking past Star Trek fans, very nice people, every last one of them, and enforcing a smile, the occasional small talk. I'm afraid someone will ask me what I'm going to do for the show, but nobody does. Now, I don't remember exactly how I got there, but I eventually found myself alone in the ship's library. It was quiet, peaceful. I sat in a comfortable chair, and I looked out the window at just the humbling beauty of the Alaskan coastline. What am I gonna do, I thought. How can I do anything that's as entertaining as the other actors? Renee Bergenois is going to sing the song that he sang in the movie Beauty and the Beast. I hate 
my life is just in one series of bad decisions. Why did I leave Star Trek? Why did I do that shitty movie, The Liars Club? Why did I let them talk me into doing The Curse? Why can't I do something better than stand by me? Why are we famous and successful like so many of my friends? Why am I living in Kansas instead of in Los Angeles? What the fuck am I doing with my life? I sat there for a long time, wallowing in self-pity and self-loathing, and then, out of nowhere, an idea. I write stories every now and then. Stories aren't that bad. Maybe I could write an essay about, I jumped out of the chair, grabbed a few sheets of paper from an empty table nearby, and I wrote across the top of it, In Defense of Nerds, by Will Wheaton. I started where all 21-year-olds who think they're clever and insightful start an essay, with the diff dictionary definition. <laughs> Nerd, slang, a stupid, irritating, ineffectual, or unattractive person. That's me! I continued to write for three pages, philosophically pontic pontificating on the titular defense, which I was so very cultured, I used the British spelling of D-E-F-E-N-C-E -E -E of nerds. Uh, what I didn't know at the time, and didn't realize until I wrote this a couple of months ago, is that I was writing both a defense and defiant declaration of who I was. For three pages, I defined myself by the things that were important to me. Being a nerd, and loving nerd things. Instead of allowing myself to be defined by who I was. A former child actor, who was struggling to find his ass with both hands, and a map, and a person who was like, your ass is there, <laughs> and a cheap guy and a person putting my hands on my ass. Which I gotta say, I've been working out, you guys. <laughs> it's not working. <laughs> when I finished writing, I felt pretty, pretty good about myself and what I'd written. I felt empowered. I felt slightly less lame. The talent show that I had been dreading couldn't come soon enough so I could take the stage and prove to the world that I was more than just a former child actor who had quit Star Trek and was now regretting it. This may sound familiar to those of you who have read Just a Geek. I was on near the end of the program, if I remember correctly. I tucked my pages into my copy of Beyond Good and Evil, because you see, I had to impress everyone with my knowledge and deep understanding of Nietzsche, who was relevant to the essay, because reasons. And I walked up onto the stage. I hate talent shows, I began with what I hoped was self-deprecating humor, because they reminded me of how singularly talented I am. Some laughter came out of the audience, and I finished introducing myself. I began reading my essay. I can't recall specifically how the entire thing unfolded. It was almost 20 years ago. But I do recall that it went well, and the audience enjoyed it. I ended it with... <laughs> Ready? <laughs> I will remind my critics that Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and Bill Gates are all nerds and nonconformists. After a dramatic pause, my name is Will Wheaton, and I am a nerd who just compared himself without a hint of self-awareness to Stephen Hawking, Albert Einstein, and Bill Gates. In my memory, which I want to make excruciatingly clear, is not entirely reliable. The audience went crazy, even though I had the audacity to make the comparison. Oh, the blind arrogance and surety of the 21-year-old philosopher. In the years that followed, I'd occasionally think back to this day in 1994, when I wrote and performed something in public for the very first time. I would wonder if it was as good as I remembered it, or as bad as I feared. I looked for the essay whenever I moved, but I never found it. Until this particular weekend. Going through my garage, clearing out space to build a home brewery, I opened boxes that I haven't opened since 1995, when I moved out of my parents' house into my own house. 
Those boxes were mostly filled with books that I didn't want or need. But they painted a very clear picture of who I was back then. A lot of science fiction and fantasy books. How-to guides on programming in C++. Some of them I even got past the second page of. I'm like, hello world, I got this. What the fuck? I was not told there would be math. <laughs> if math, then end. Goodbye. <laughs> Unrelated to this, I found the code that runs Reddit. It basically says, if bacon, then bacon. <laughs> Else bacon. Wild bacon, narwhal. If narwhal, then cats. So. And that, by the way, Richard Stalin is open source. And including, in addition to those books, there was every book Henry Rollins had ever written up to that point. Volume after volume of William Burroughs and some of the beat writers. There were a number of books on film and acting and a large number of philosophy books. Among the philosophy books, was my copy of Beyond Good and Evil. Oh, God, I thought to myself. Now I know why I haven't looked in these boxes in years. I was such an insufferable douchebag back then. I should have listened more and talked less. I grabbed the book and I tossed it into the donation box. It landed on its front with its spine, its spine facing me. I turned back to the box I was emptying and my eye caught some pieces of paper folded up and shoved into a book, like a bookmark. I slowly turned back and I looked at them for a long time, not sure that I wanted to see what the 1994, 21-year-old philosopher douchebag version of me had to say, but fairly certain that I had no choice. I slowly reached out for the book and I picked it up. I cringed and pulled out the papers. I unfolded them and I saw in Defense of Nerds by Will Wheaton. Oh. Holy shit. I sat down and I read the entire three pages. It's written by the 21-year-old I was. I kept it. And I took it into my office and scanned it because it was something that I wanted to make sure I had forever. I'm going to read it for you now. <laughs> Sense of Nerds by Will Wheaton. Nerd. No. Slay. A stupid, irritating, ineffectual, or unattractive person. An intelligent, but single-minded person. Obsessed with a non-social hobby or pursuit. A computer nerd. <laughs> An interesting way of saying get a life. This is on a Star Trek cruise, pandering to the nerds, and Palm Storm cover band. <laughs> An interesting way of saying get a life from a society that embraces monster truck racing in the WWF, don't you think? <laughs> well, I have a life. We all do. Our lives just don't agree with what society has determined to be socially acceptable. It is historically proven that society feels threatened by that which it does not understand, and in most cases fears, and attempts to destroy it. I actually did this during the reading in 1984. Such is the fate of the nerd. Experienced this in elementary school. Being more interested in academics than athletics, I was jeered at by the popular children. As they went to the playground to hurl balls at one another in a senseless barbaric competition known as dodgeball. Please note the quotes. <laughs> While they were developing their athletic prowess, we were developing our minds. While they were developing, sorry, while when they went to parties and passed out on the couch. <laughs> we played D&D &D and passed out behind the Dungeon Master's screen. Next page. But the 
Dictionary of Contemporary Slang says that in the early 1970s, an underground comic book portrayed nerds as a subspecies of suburban dullards. Subspecies? <laughs> I don't think so, Dictionary of Contemporary Slang. I think subculture is more accurate. <laughs> Our achievements are not less important or even greater than theirs. They are simply different. Defeating a monstrous wyvern or closing the final stitch of your Star Trek uniform is just as exhilarating as scoring the winning touchdown or getting into a fraternity. Why is it then that society feels it necessary to label Star Trek clubs, a place where it's acceptable to wear your spacesuit and share the defeat of a Borg, as weird and antisocial when it calls fraternities, a place where it is acceptable to get drunk and sexually harass everyone, an important part of every boy's college life? Could it be that because Trekkies don't fit squarely into society and frat guys are as predictable as the dawning of the day. <laughs> Quite a clever turn of phrase, we the audience is going to love that. <laughs> that society feels more comfortable with the belligerent drunk than it does with the free thinker. Certainly they are less threatening. <laughs> Our slang words that they can't possibly understand, like BRB and AFK, are more cryptic than the grunting and snarling offered us by the jock, and must consequently be dangerous. I propose that the societal whole is threatened by anything which is my thesis. I propose. That the societal whole is threatened by anything which challenges its conformity and sense of righteousness, and as a result, it persecutes the nonconformist. Society persecutes the nerd. Page three. <laughs> you guys, it's a legit scheme. It takes great courage to stand for that which you believe in and hold dear in the face of such persecution generally born of fear and ignorance. And no, I'm not suggesting that protesting the cancellation of Star Trek <laughs> or taking your Dungeon Master's Guide and Fiend Folio with you to your parochial school puts you in league with Alexander Solzhenitsyn. I couldn't say the guy's name then, I can't say it now, so, of course, that's the dissident I chose to put into the essay. <laughs> Alexander Solzhenitsyn? Solzhenitsyn? That's the guy. <laughs> but all things done in the presence of an unsympathetic populace are worthy of accolade, no matter how small. Uh, in regard to the nonconformist, the philosopher Nietzsche said, <laughs> now it says here, read 29. So it is at this point in the talent show that I open my book of Beyond Good and Evil without affectation <laughs> and read the following. It is the business of the very few to be independent. It is a privilege of the strong. And whoever attempts it, even with the best right but without being obliged to do so, proves that he is probably not only strong, but also daring beyond measure. <laughs> he enters into a labyrinth. He multiplies a thousandfold the dangers which life in itself already brings with it. Not the least of which is that no one can see how and where he loses his way, becomes isolated, and is torn piecemeal by some minotaur of conscience. <laughs> Supposing such a one comes to grief, it is not so far from the comprehension of men that they neither feel it nor sympathize with it. And he cannot any longer go back. He cannot even go back again into the sympathy of men. The book is closed and dropped. <laughs> I will remind my critics that Albert Einstein, Stephen Hawking, and Bill Gates 
are all nerds and nonconformists. My name is Will Wheaton, and I am a nerd. It's not as good as I remember it. <laughs> but it's not as bad as I was afraid. It is the very best that 21-year-old version of me could do. And I'm proud of him. I am proud of him for taking a chance, for facing his fear of being laughed off the stage and speaking very passionately about something that mattered to him and still matters very much to me. I am so grateful that on that day in 1994, I set aside pretending to think about things and I actually thought about things. It was a small but important step toward finding my way into the life that I now have. And it's a really good life. In fact, if I looked at the foundation upon which I built my adult life, I would not be surprised to find that this essay is awfully close to the keystone. The end. Thank you very much.